I think we'll get started. So welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar on Towards Excellence, a Federal Initiative in Return to Work and Disability Management. Today, we're going to really be focused on a couple of things. We're gonna have first a panel discussion on uh, how best to implement professionalization through your workforce. And then we're going to just give you a highlight, a bit of a trailer on what's coming up uh, through the association uh, with a platform that will be introduced probably sometime this fall. So we're really excited about that, but I just wanted to let you know that it's coming. Um, my name is John Much. I am the chair of the Canadian Society of Disability Management Professionals, and I'm also the executive director of the Return to Work program at the WSIB. So welcome everybody. Sorry, I just... So, and today's session is to raise awareness of opportunities under the federal and BC government grants geared to build a culture of accommodation inclusions in the workplace. To equip our disability management professionals with background of disability management <clears throat> in the workplace, Canadian perspective to enable them to promote and access funding for their work sites, including the workplace disability management audits and continuing education and professionalization. So that's what we're going to accomplish today. We're gonna to have a panel presentation. And our speakers today are the Mr. Wolfgang Zimmerman. He's the president of the Pacific Coast University for Workplace Health Sciences and executive director of the National Institute of Disability Management and Research, also known as NIDMAR. Having a degree in civil and forest engineering following an industrial accident in 1977, he was retrained and continued to work for his pre-disability employer until his retirement from the organization in 2010. He has received many awards and accommodations for his work on disability prevention and rehabilitation and including the Order of British Columbia. So we're very honored to have Wolfgang speak. Also today with us, we have Rodney Cook is the Vice President of the Workplace Health and Safety Services at the WSAB. He oversees all aspects of workplace health and safety. Rod also serves on multiple board of directors, including the National Institute of Disability Management and Research and Excellence Canada. And at the WSAB, received the Mental Health at Work Silver Level Certification from Excellence Canada under Rod's leadership. Also with us today is Sari Saarinen. Sari is responsible for protecting workers' rights, promoting safe and sustainable work transformations while ensuring the health and safety of workers. She has a passion, and I know this for sure, for meeting people, learning their stories, and building relationships in support of lasting, meaningful work adaptations for workers today and tomorrow. Sari comes to the National Union from the Airline Division, which represents uh, members from coast to coast in Canada. And I don't think I mentioned that her title is National Health and Safety and Environment Director at Unifor. Also with us today, all the way from Nova Scotia is Dr. Craig Gose. Uh, he is a psychiatrist and has extensive background in the area of occupational mental health. He completed his residencies in psychiatry at the University of Toronto and is a graduate of the Harvard University of Global Mental Health, Trauma and Recovery Program. He has worked with various pharmaceutical companies set on their advisory boards and speakers bureaus and have been involved with pharmacological research projects. So if I can ask uh, the presenters just to mute their lines until it comes to your time. Um, I'm just getting a bit of feedback noise. So prevention and safe work practices, and I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, will always be a priority, but the data tells us that workers are regularly injured. And so the big question we always have in disability management is what we do when that does happen. And we know what the effects to the individual, the family, the financial position, and what it does say about the culture of a company depends upon how the worker is supported throughout the return to work process. Today, as we know, we have a talent crisis. I think Stats Canada and 
in 2021 says there's a, nearly a million vacancies with employers lowering hiring qualification just to get bums in seats. I think we hear that employees are now interviewing employers for jobs. So the business case to professionalize our disability management practice is a simple argument. You can reduce your disability related expenditures, you can reduce your long term disability uptake, and you can maintain a stronger attachment between your valued employee and your organization. Here at the WSAB, where I work, we have over 300 return to work specialists across the province, all the way from Thunder Bay to Kingston and Windsor. Our return to work specialists provide return to work service for injured people and their employers in order to affect positive return to work outcomes. The return to work division under my leadership supports the attainment and maintenance of professional de designations in return to work and disability management, vocation rehabilitation and other related. We offer educational and work ex experience requirements to qualify for professional designations with three internationally and nationally recognized governing bodies, including NINMAR. We provide tuition assistance programs to do that. The maintenance includes researches, provides and promotes internal and external learning sessions within the fields of return to work, disability management and vocation rehabilitation. And we provide financial support by paying annual renewal fees. And that's why it's so important as an organization, as an insurer that we're here to professionalize our staff as we can talk the same language. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rod Cook, who's going to continue the WSIB story from his perspective. Thank you, Rod. Well, thanks so much, um, John. I just want to check that I am coming through clear. Yes, awesome. And it's uh, it's a great to, great to be a part of this uh, panel and um, share some of what we're doing at WSIB. Uh, I want to start off. Um, by talking about um, why disability management and return to work matter from the perspective of the work that um, my team does in workplace health and safety services and um, many of the employers we reach out to across the province of Ontario. Um, John in his introduction talked about um, you know, the mental health crisis and the changing uh, nature of work um, and a, a couple of important facts, I think, are that the research shows that investing in mental health programs that address awareness, prevention, and return to work do deliver strong returns. Generally, we talk about the returns um, the, same as, the same as generally in health and safety. It can increase retention. Um, it eases attraction of talent. Um, there's some intangibles that are more difficult to measure, but we know it has an impact in terms of employee engagement. And we can even make the argument around effective uh, risk management. And as John said at the beginning, um, with this current war for talent, the, the stakes are even higher. And the combination of the challenge for organizations to be able to attract uh, top talent um, because the competition is so strong and the changing nature of work that arguably makes it um, easier for employers to um, look at accommodations. The business case is stronger than ever. If we talk about um, the different types of investments um, that can be made with respect to disability management and return to work. The, the, the starting point is really um, occupational um, competency development. And, and a, a couple of things um, that we do at WSIB. So John mentioned um, the investment made in his team with respect to return to work specialists across the province. Um, within my team in workplace health and safety services, 70% of what we call our, our validators, um, uh, over 70% have the disability management professional credential of the CDMP. Another type of investment worth considering 
um, is looking at specialized equipment to accommodate individuals. An Institute for Work and Health study on accommodation for people with disabilities found a net benefit in each workplace in which an, ac in which an accommodation was met, uh, made. So the cost benefit evaluation was conducted and for employers, the economic benefit ranged from two to seven times the cost that occurred. That study was done um, back in 2018. So um, again, from an accommodation perspective, the return on investment is, is clear. And the third area is professional services. Um, you know, we know that many companies fail to implement return to work programs because they don't have the resources or expertise to get to get started. Now, um, John has talked about some of um, the resources at WSIB from a return, return to work uh, perspective. And in the program that under workplace health and safety services at WSIB, we actually have um, return to work topics that can be completed where we offer incentives for organizations to build their competency um, and we connect them to providers uh, across the province that can help build the competency of disability management and return to work. So um, looking at the overall business benefits, um, again, referring to work that was done by the Institute for Work and Health, um, they found that the average direct cost of a lost time uh, compensation claim is approximately $39,000 in manufacturing, and it can be up to 78,000 in the construction sector. Then when you factor in the indirect costs, um, generally we assume you double the direct costs. So um, the real benefit that we're talking about here from the financial lens, because we've talked about some of um, the advantages from a talent perspective already, um, you can avoid indirect costs and you can avoid the direct costs, sorry, you can avoid the indirect costs that are associated with injury or illness. And the costs, you know, can include things like re replacer or, or damaged property, material or equipment, administrative costs, all of those add up for an organization. Furthermore, with our new rate framework, premiums are set according to the actual claim experience. So you can also have an impact on your premium. And the rate framework generally, generally allows for about a 15% change to an employer's premium rate yearly based on their health and safety performance. And lastly, there's the financial benefits from the intangibles that include improved employee retention, morale, improved production quality, and your corporate rep uh, reputation. So moving on to um, the overall return on investment. Um, you know, this study that I'm referring to was, was done just last year. It, it was conducted over a couple of years, but we sponsored the study because, um, you know, part of the work that we want to do is better inform businesses that health and safety is an investment. It's not a cost in an organization. And this recent study by the Institute for Work and Health estimated the return on investment for every dollar that was invested, um, the return was um, between $1.24 and $2.14. So that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Um, you, know, if, you know, if it was our own money, I think a lot of us would be making this investment, but purely from a lens of uh, an employer and thinking about the impact that you can have on your organization and your people, um, health and safety, which is inclusive of disability management return to work, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable uh, what you could be doing inside your organization. And this doesn't include um, the incentives if you're in Ontario that the WSIB is currently offering to um, help businesses um, during pandemic recovery. Because again, there's also, um, uh, you know, 
not included in this return on investment, there's um, funds that are available to help make the investment in health and safety through the WSIB. Um, in the slides, um, we included some testimonials. I'm not going to read those to you. Um, and this is just one um, that, was, uh, that was included. We have many testimonials um, that, uh, that we've uh, started to pull together to show different industries, different size of organizations. It doesn't matter. Um, the story is uh, for each company is pretty remarkable and um, shows the, uh, the impacts um, that, uh, that are taking place. So just to wrap up, um, in the uh, w WSIB Health and Safety Program, um, we currently have over 2,800 members. Um, again, they represent different sizes. Um, they represent um, different types of organizations. And uh, I think regardless of what industry you're in, or what size of organization you are, um, there's a really good um, story that can be told for your organization uh, here as well. So John, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And I know we're having a, a panel discussion um, later for questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and for the audience, we are going to take questions after. And Rod, just to give you a heads up, there's a question already for you, but uh, we'll hold off okay. on that till the end. Uh, so I want to welcome Sari. You're up. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, um, just a technical thing here. I'm sharing my screen for slides. A nod from anybody. Okay. Well, I'm going ahead. I'm sharing my screen. It's up, Sari. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. So um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, some of you um, across the country um, may uh, recognize Unifor as being a, a bargaining agent that recognizes or that represents your workers. Um, we are Canada's largest private sector union. We have over um, 315,000 members across the country, uh, nearly 700 local unions, um, nearly 3,000 collective agreements. So that means there is continuous bargaining going on um, across our workplaces. And that means that it's that relationship that's being built as well. Collective agreements are the, uh, the rules of engagement that uh, roadmap that's put together for the parties to build that workplace culture. And uh, yes, um, health and safety is uh, near and dear to me. And you heard from Rod as well, how important uh, that foundation is in the workplaces and what are the elements, not just the minimum standards that regulations and legislations afford us, but it is really that uh, foundation that is continuously being built in the workplace and collective agreements do that. And it is looking at those relationships. And what we found um, over the years um, is really, how do we collaborate together? Prevention, everyone wants to ensure that they themselves, as well as their workforce, our members go home whole at the end of their work day. Unfortunately, uh, we know that there is on average a thousand fatalities across Canada, uh, workplace fatalities, and of course there is a number of uh, accidents, some very um, difficult uh, life-altering incidents that happen in workplaces. And how then do you continue building that workplace culture? And that's when we look at jointly. We've had great success looking at joint health and safety committees, how you're able to put those joint um, ideas together. How do you build on that um, safety culture in the workplace? And when you start looking at disability prevention as well, because once prevention fails and you're on that continuum of injury, where does uh, your employee, our member go? Where does that individual go? Either they go into uh, an insurance scheme or they go into the workers' compensation world. And once rehabilitations have taken place, how do they return to the workplace? And that's really where a lot of the challenges happen is 
rehabilitating the person back into the workplace. And I'll share a couple of stories. Um, we had an industrial setting where um, a, a large uh, manufacturing setting where there were about 250 um, individuals who were on long-term disability. Many of them, the majority of them had been on that long-term disability for over 10 years. You know what that means. It's really difficult then to come back to the workplace. You've lost some connections. And we don't always do a great job either of maintaining that connection with our members. And so um, at this particular location, uh, there was a new uh, manager that came in and started looking at those ledgers of, hmm, how come we've got so many millions of dollars going into long-term disability? How come these individuals are not coming back to the workplace? So this is Reader's Digest version. There was lots of discussions that took place um, from both sides. And of course, um, with collective agreements, you've got um, um, looking at um, many of those um, items that uh, give you that um, relationship in the workplace of how do you ensure that you're able to bring um, safely uh, and uh, sustainably individuals who've been injured. So it takes an entire village to be able to do that. And the conversations took place with uh, engineering. It took place with um, ergonomists. It took place with the health and safety reps, with the benefit reps, with the injured worker, with everyone. So what they did at that particular workplace, and this may not happen in every workplace, but it can, is they had what's called an open season where everyone exercised their, uh, uh, their seniority to, to bid for jobs. And this included the 250 individuals who had been on long-term disability. So once it came their time to bid for a job, they looked at what was available and how do you make those accommodations, those changes for that individual. So you do need to have that openness from both sides of how do we make those adjustments. Of those 250, um, 200 were able to be accommodated due to the nature of their injury, their um, abilities, physical abilities in the workplace, and 50 were not successfully uh, returned to the workplace. And of those 200, that included two individuals that had the use of one arm because of the nature of their injury. And this is a manufacturing facility. So it can happen, but it's that collaboration. And it is ensuring and recognizing the relationship that um, employers have with their employees. It's recognizing us as union members of the relationship that we have with our members. And how do you fit those two relationships together and have those conversations? They're not the easiest conversations to have, but it is finding that success in the workplace. And it is, again, that return on your investment, uh, Institute of Work and Health, you can go onto their website and find that study. They have a wealth of information of looking at how do we make it successful in the workplaces. And when you have a return on investment of $1.24 to $2.10, that's huge huge changes and culture changes in the workplace as well and building those opportunities and where then can you put those investments into the workplace to ensure that you are preventing additional incidences from happening in the workplace. So that's an example of a large workplace. When you start looking at smaller workplaces, they're the most difficult and they're the ones that I have the hard palpitations on as I work with the workplace parties to ensure that it be, doesn't become confrontational. But again, prevention has to be key. You have to ensure that you've got that prevention. And the courses that come through the CDMP uh, program really give you a great foundation of what is occupational health and safety in your workplace. How do you communicate that in your workplace? It's not just reliant on, well, it's uh, inherent. Everybody knows. Not everybody knows. Uh, we all have um, different um, uh, subjective ideas of what risk is, 
what hazards are. So the course gives you jointly an opportunity. And I encourage uh, workplaces, and I've had these discussions internally with our members as well, is jointly participating in this opportunity of, uh, of, uh, of educating, of building your skill sets, because it is a skill set that you need to have of how do you find the solutions? How do you uh, overcome some of the obstacles of, uh, of conflict uh, conversations that you have? They're not the easiest, but when you're all on the same page of enhancing your workplace culture, knowing that there's a collaboration because every item there is common ground and it's finding that common ground and working towards that. So I'm gonna end my presentation there. I'm sure there's lots of uh, conversations and I'll turn it over to you, John. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sari, from your perspective. That's really good. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Craig Gose. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to try to share my slides. Hopefully this will work. Uh, one second. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sorry for the technical problems. I thought we had them fixed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm a clinician, so my presentation will focus mostly on the clinical aspects of, of what COVID and its aftermath has caused to the workplace and to the workers' mental health. Um, uh, there's lots of new federal money around for the facilitation of disability management and development of associated programs. And this should greatly help uh, the identification of workers at, uh, at risk and at need of help to maintain them in the workplace and have good productivity and less uh, uh, mental health morbidity in the individual as a person. So we're at a good point with, with increased funding, increased disability management, and uh, we today I'll point out some of the clinical issues that we need to watch for when we help with uh, disability management in this population. Um, disability management is quite beneficial, as I've heard from my two previous speakers. Uh, it helps to maintain a higher level of worker health and uh, continue it while staying in the workplace. And I think what was being said was that productivity is the most important thing. Uh, uh, from a business perspective, because that's what loses money. Uh, as, as If we can keep the worker healthy and productive and in the workplace, uh, it's a much better outcome and it's very cost effective as was previously uh, talked about. So early intervention is an investment really. It's a prophylaxis and it identifies workers at risk in the workplace, but who are still functional. And hopefully if it's effective, it keeps them from leaving the workplace and costing uh, treatment costs plus replacement costs, and it becomes quite expensive. And uh, what I'd like to do next is focus on one of the major adverse impacts of COVID that I think is occurring and that I see in the office setting. And uh, this really is social isolation. One of the biggest features of COVID is workers have now been sent home to work through the internet from their home place. That's really bad. It's creating tremendous social isolation. Most people don't realize that your workplace is probably the primary social contact you have. And you, some people are not very social people. So outside of work, they don't do much. So if work is gone, their social life is gone and they basically are in social isolation. And it's a double-edged sword. At first, people think that's great. I can sit home all day. But what we see happen is people roll out of bed in the pajamas and work on the internet. And we've seen cases even in CNN where, where a guy forgot to put on the other half of his suit. So it's having detrimental effects. So people are in their home environment working, and there's no escape now. Their home environment has become an extension of their work environment, and that's not good psychologically. The socialization that they've lost from the workplace is big because that's a primary source of support. We're social animals. We uh, do well with peer support, camaraderie, the chance to beef and share our experience. When you're working at home, uh, particularly if you're a single individual, if you're living in a one bedroom apartment, you don't have much other activity going on. Uh, you don't get that emotional support. And uh, uh, you get then kind of thinking very negatively. Depression increases. You become a, a distorted perspective. You don't have any balance to feedback. Uh, paranoia develops. So you see the whole gamut of clinical symptoms increasing in workers who have been home for a long time. Now, not everybody is like that. Some people is wonderful, but a lot of people are having great difficulty from the social isolation 
associated with working from home. And it's becoming uh, an increased problem. There's decreased performance. Uh, we see um, substance use increasing because there's nobody to stop you. If you want to drink a bottle of beer while you're typing your data, who, who sees it? You can't do that when you're at work. So people who had mental health issues before, subclinical, are now turning into clinical. So you like to have a, a few beer, but now you're drinking during the day. Or you smoke the, a, a joint once in a while, now you're smoking while you're doing your typing. So we see increased uh, unhealthy behaviors in many people who are working at home now. And uh, they also feel more alone. Their world kind of telescopes in. And uh, it, it might sound silly for those who have families and extended kids, but a lot of the younger workforce are, are not married or don't have kids or they're just two people. So there is a very big sense of isolation. <clears throat> um, initially, it was thought to be great because it decreased the risk of infection, uh, but it's bad for your mental health. So you're trading off less COVID infection for uh, increased mental health. I don't know which is better. Um, the negative thinking distortion is becoming significant, particularly if these are people who are, are borderline, uh, who are marginal type personalities before, who functioned, but really had subclinical difficulties. These are now erupting into an issue. Uh, we see decreased self-care. Uh, people you don't have to get up and put your makeup on, put your uh, stuff on to go to work. So people start only showering every few days. Uh, people don't attend to their personal care, their self-care. Uh, people spend the day in their pajamas. There's also increased physical sedentary in this. People don't get any exercise. A lot of people used to walk to work or within the office environment, you were moving around a lot. Now you're sitting. So there's a decrease in, in health, physical health generally, associated also with this decrease in mental health. So these are at risk groups. So for our disability management, we want to really look closely at at home workers, which is huge because uh, the employers now are finding that it's it's working well in some ways to have the worker at home and you don't have to play for office space. And so a lot of people are not going back into the office and it's going to be an ongoing problem. And I think we have to adjust our workplace management to uh, help people who work at home stay healthier. So disability management and all that whole programming needs to be aware of this, that these are very high at risk group of people, those who work at home and uh, have limited face-to-face -face contact. Um, so we need to develop ways to increase social interaction despite being at home. Uh, and there are many ways to do that, more group sessions, uh, more uh, fitness programs via telemedicine or tele, uh, telehealth. And so we want to look at that group. <clears throat> Those who work at home are very much at risk. And we're seeing a lot of problems from the clinic and the things coming to my office and coming to my colleagues' offices. And uh, uh, the insurers, people going off with sunlight, with workers' comp. And the real issue is social isolation and its fallout of all these other symptoms. <clears throat> so groups at risk. Um, are those, as I was saying, who are at home, they have, as to restate what I'm saying, they have great psychological risk due to the impact of not having uh, social contact. And also those who work at um, uh, public service, policemen, firemen, uh, nurses, hospital workers, they're also very intensely involved with too much socialization. They're kind of the opposite. They're bombarded with social context, mostly negative. And so they're getting uh, very much depressed, very anxious. And we're seeing a, a tremendous amount of post-traumatic stress and also delayed onset post-traumatic stress. People who, when they're in the midst of the firefight, they're coping okay. But six months later, when it quiets down a bit, they're crashing and people are not recognizing that. That was a six-month window where if you identified they were smoldering but not yet on fire, you could have helped them. And again, uh, at a human level, it saves a lot of psychiatric morbidity. But at a cost level, if you can keep people well in the workplace, modified duties, different duties, whatever, it's still cost effective and also better for the individual self-esteem. So essential workers like hospital staff, RNs, paramedics, firemen, police, et cetera, these are a group that are particularly at risk and need to be monitored and assessed regularly to see when they're getting into trouble. Uh, substance use is quite high in some of these groups uh, to help cope and uh, that's another problem. Uh, another real issue with these is as we identify more people at risk and more people in need of help, the system is already clogged. So uh, 
at some point, I think there's going to have to be extra funding to provide some of these people need actual treatment and uh, the system now is really at capacity. And uh, if we were in a, a, a non-socialized medicine situation, it probably would be cost effective to provide treatment for these people as well as uh, uh, as the disability management for our whole package. But in our system, that's not possible. So we need to advocate for better funding for some of these uh, health services that are now clogged up. So uh, for this particular at-risk group who have too much social contact, really too much negative social contact, uh, we want to watch for depression, as I said, anxiety and post-traumatic stress type symptoms. And we really want to be checking up on these people and providing services to them uh, on a very frequent and available basis to prevent further deterioration. Being at work is cost effective. It's only paying for the treatment. When they're off work, you have to pay for the replacement income for someone else to do their job and also for their their treatment etc so again uh, i very much agree that uh, uh, disability management keeping the individual at work and treating before they get really sick is very cost effective a lot of studies show that the cost of health care is not physician fees is not nurses doctors or hospitals it's lost productivity and i think that the system is starting to very much recognize that And in general, those who are vulnerable to the mental health effects of our workplace deterioration are those who previously had mental health issues who are at the threshold. There are very few truly healthy people around. Most people are functional to varying degrees and their threshold to decompensate is variable. Some people, they don't have much room before they decompensate, very much stress margin. Others can handle a tremendous amount. So we're finding those that were marginal before are now hitting their threshold where they can't cope. And if we can identify those before they actually crash, uh, at a human level, tremendous help to the individual. At a, a society cost level, it's very effective. So we want to look at when we're doing a disability management. Those who've had previous trauma are highly at risk to have further problems. Uh, most people who, who uh, suffer a traumatic event, if you're previously healthy, you, you, you have an acute adjustment reaction and then you do okay. But we find that those who don't do well, when we get deeply into their background, they've had previous traumas of all sorts. So we want to very much screen and look at people's trauma history, and particularly if these people are working in traumatic jobs, such as in the hospital and health environment. Uh, female workers are also a group at work, uh, at risk. If they work at home, we're finding that if uh, a female is at home all day with her partner, who's also off work, working from home, if their relationship is not that great, or even if it's okay, there's a, a, an irritability factor that creeps in, and we're seeing a rise in domestic abuse uh, because of these th situations where there's there's no escape. People are put in the same space for too long and, and irritating each other. Uh, in general, too, Indigenous people, uh, they're already a stressed group. They're frequently marginalized, a lot of substance abuse, mental health issues, and really due to, as we're seeing in, in the news, intergenerational trauma. And these people are, as employers, employees are particularly at risk and, and uh, uh, can be helped tremendously. Uh, and in general, any marginalized group is greater at risk. They have less margin to cope with additional stress. And disability management and increased identification can be of great help to these people. The other issue is, I think there's a huge potential liability for provincial workers' compensation programs and other insurers as many of these workers will find it impossible to continue working unless identified early as needing help and given that help. Uh, so a huge amount of people at risk to go off onto the disability payment section of our system. Uh, there's tremendous increase in substance abuse. We need more addiction treatment resources, which are already full. Uh, workers who had pre-existing mental illness, they are always at risk for, for decompensation because uh, they don't have a lot of margin to cope with further stress. Uh, they need extra help and they're probably getting marginal help as it was. Uh, long-term psychiatric care and ongoing disability management is needed for the long-term. It's, it's not a short-term thing. I think it's gonna be present for a long time to get this situation uh, normalized. And uh, there'll be a lot of political impact from it, I suspect, as there's only so much money to go around and do you build a new uh, skating rink or do you add a new uh, therapist at the local clinic with, with funding? I'm simplifying it, but I think the point is obvious. 
uh, in general, mental health services were difficult to access before COVID. It's worse now. There are many more people seeking treatment than there is availability. COVID has had a negative impact on all Canadians in the workplace. Nobody has been unscathed by it, and we need to recognize that. And a lot of people have a stoic front and hide it, and they're much more impacted than people think. So don't be, be fooled by somebody who seems unscathed. It's likely that they are not. Um, there's going to be a lot of need for acute and medium-term treatment to avoid going into chronic illness. That's what we want to prevent. We want to fix it, as I used the, the comment, while smoldering before it catches on fire. And we want to maintain people in the workforce because it's better for them as individuals and it's better for the economy. So with disability management, as we heard earlier talkers and speakers, we want to identify accommodations, job modifications, and various things that will keep people in the workplace. This will need uh, a potential uh, cooperative stance with employer and employee or employees organizations so that because uh, a lot of employers are going to find some degree of hardship. And uh, so it'll be important to work together with the congeniality. And again, federal funding to increase disability management and associated things is a timely initiative and if implemented well, it should be helpful. And just for interest, everybody likes statistics. 50% of Canadians have decreased mental health, 10% markedly so since this whole COVID pandemic problem. Anxiety symptoms are like 40%. People are really anxious. Worker health is down. 80% have been impacted to some degree by the COVID pandemic in a mental health way. This is interesting. Alcohol use is up across Canada. 18 to 54 year olds have greater than 20% increased use. And I suspect we're seeing a case of self-medication. People who are really stressed out, uh, have no real access to other alternatives are starting to drink because uh, alcohol is an axiolytic, it's an anti-anxiety agent, but it's not a good one, obviously. But there's proof that we're seeing sort of independent proof of the stress of the population because the, the self-use of alcohol is going up quite high. And again, if you were stressed and marginally coping before, you're more at risk to turn to substance abuse, alcohol, marijuana, or whatever, to lessen your emotional pain. And in Canada, there were, they figure there were 15,000 deaths per year alcohol related. And that's likely to increase as things stand. And uh, in closing, just the comment, mental health in the workplace was a significant issue pre-COVID. There was still a lot of problems that were being dealt with. Now it's gotten worse. There were at least a half million workers missing work weekly due to mental health issues. And this is increasing because of the adverse impact of COVID and changes in the workplace situation on Canadian workers. Um, so we need a conjoint effort on this. Uh, government agencies, clinical organizations, unions and worker groups to work together with employers and insurers. It can't be one isolated component. It's no good to have triple grade A disability management with no resources for treatment. So the, 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 it's like a transmission. The cogs have to balance and they have to match and they also have to connect so that you don't have a fantastic organization here, but nowhere to send the people. So we need to make sure we have an integrated system and that all aspects of it get equally funded or adequately funded. And uh, so worker stress is now at an all time high and we need to address that and get workplace health, mental health management going strongly to identify difficulties, offer help, ideally to keep the worker in the workplace and productive. And uh, over time, the COVID effect will hopefully settle down and we will be left in a good place again. And uh, hopefully the focus on workplace health will lead to an improvement in the situation going forward so that we will be better than we were before COVID. Um, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you very much. I know we didn't start off well, but I can tell you, based on your presentation, Dr. Gross, it worked out really well. And then, oh, thank out. so thank you. Really informative. And to Rod and Sari, I think it really gave us a really strong, different perspective of and a really good rationale for effective disability management programs. And I know I used that analogy of preaching to the choir, but 
hopefully we've given you enough songs that you can support if you're disability management professionals and your discussions with the HR, with your employers to really help sell the, this message that you heard today from Sari and Rod and, and Dr. Ghost for sure. So we've got those perspectives and now we're going to ask Wolfgang to talk. He's the big thinker, the big picture guy here, and he's going to um, give us his perspective of things. So over to you, Wolfgang. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, uh, John. I don't know about the, the big picture side of it, things, but uh, I think the um, you know the the perspectives in terms of economic benefits and uh, from uh, disability management programs, I think that uh, uh, certainly has been covered off really well. I want to take this uh, you know to a, a bit of a different level. Obviously, I'm going to sort of want to look at this from a personal context, but also from an attitude and from a leadership context, which I think is absolutely critical in order to uh, in order to achieve uh, sustainable outcomes rather than just talking about them. And, um, you know, for for some of you, this will be sort of a, a bit of, um, you know, history and you're aware of this, but I, I always look at, uh, you know, how extremely fortunate I was by being able to count on uh, the leadership of both the union and the employer when when I got hurt, which is now you know many many decades ago, when uh, first week on the job, a tree broke my back and left me with a severe spinal injury. And um, the goal was always that I wanted to uh, get back to work. This was a logging camp here on Vancouver Island. Uh, what 450 guys working in that camp, and. Um, the the administrative office where were about 40 or 45 folks working in there was about as in as inaccessible as you'll ever find i mean it's you know uh, there were no ramp stairs everywhere and so on but uh, given the fact that uh, you know the accident had happened sort of the first week it started on monday morning and it's one of those things um, here's a power saw good luck go for it uh, uh, on friday friday morning this, this basically happened, but there was also after that there was, you know, the company accepted responsibility because there was no training, and afterwards, it radically uh, the training program radically changed. But uh, the reason I'm explaining this is because both the union and the um, and the company uh, came together, identified an opportunity for me to carry on in an administrative role. And then after, after the, this was sort of solved and from an attitudinal point of view, they brought together the engineering department to figure out how to build the, um, how to build access. It took them a couple of hours to figure that out. It took them a week to actually operationalize that. The carpentry crew in the camp basically built the access, uh, you know, the, different parts of the building, modified the washroom, widened the doors and, and, and so on. But if it hadn't been for the leadership, the individual leadership of fellow by the name of Nick Boss, who was the steelworkers local camp chair and the employer, the HR manager, Ross Trevoki, uh, and their personal advocacy, this would just never have happened. Because then going forward, it was the, the lack of access would have always been the excuse as to why I would never have been able to come back to work. So I think that is one part that I think for everybody who works uh, in, in this space, that um, whether or not we advocate on an individual level or whether we are able to compel the organizations that we work for from an institutional point of view to advance and uh, drive better opportunities. I mean, this is really all around innovation. It's about thought leadership and it's about collaboration, but it's the attitude of the workplace that is completely key. When I see that over the last 10 years, we've made absolutely no progress in increasing employment participation for individuals with disabilities. We uh, we talk a great line, and um, there was a, a there was a um, a recent uh, review by uh, the Financial Times out of the UK, where the hundred largest organisations in the UK 
talk about disability inclusion as part of their mission statements, but um, with 99% of them having included a disability inclusion statement, but less than 50% have actually got a program in place. That really all comes down to leadership at whatever level, whether that's on the front line or whether that's at the most senior uh, executive level, that is really key in, in driving sustainable outcomes. When I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when I look at, um, you know, the, the picture across the country, we have 1.4 million Canadians with disabilities that live in poverty. In this province alone, here in BC, we have uh, in and around 130,000 people that uh, are on disability uh, social assistance. And, um, and Craig, I uh, want to pick up on, on a comment that he made about the impact of COVID, because that is certainly <clears throat> an area where there is huge impact going forward. And that's certainly recognized on a public policy level, because if you happen to be an individual that suffers from long COVID, your claim was not accepted, it was not occupationally related, you don't have long-term disability insurance, and even if you do, it's becoming a huge challenge, then what are your options? It's certainly being recognized here at a public policy level that this could, going forward, create a huge challenge. So when we also look at the various pieces of accessibility legislation with the federal accessibility legislation where every federal government department needs to have um, an accessibility plan by the end of this year. And in this province, we just brought in, or the government just brought into force as of September 1st, accessibility legislation that by September 1st next year, 750 organizations, we are certainly recognize that we are behind Ontario in terms of the AODA, but um, you know, it, this is a step in the right direction that 750 public sector organizations in this province need to have an accessibility plan. And that includes all of our municipal governments, post-secondary institutions, the entire healthcare sector. It includes all of our crown corporations. And as part of that, of course, having a disability management program certainly from my perspective, is the absolute first and pivotal step if you are creating an accessibility plan for your organization. Because if you're not committed towards supporting your own workforce, where individuals acquire a mental or physical health impairment, you will never hire somebody with a disability from <laughs> the outside. And having sort of worked in this space for so many years and um, you know, having, having failed and we've heard earlier the level of support that is required and um, you know, look at, looking at my own history where I've basically failed um, a, a colleague of mine who, um, who got hurt with a similar type injury as I have and um, who decided that it was, an, it was also an industrial accident, so the economic side of his situation was taken care of, but he did not get the right level of support. He did not come back to work. He was living with chronic pain, and he waited until, um, his, um, until his youngest son graduated from high school, and then one day decided to, uh, March 31st, 1988, decided to hook a hose to his exhaust, lift himself into his van, and turn the key. So we can all make and have a huge impact. We can make a difference. But it comes down to the attitude in the workplace and it comes down to the leadership, whether or not we work for a union, whether we work for a company, whether we work for you know, uh, a WCB or, or any other organization, we can, we can and we will make um, a difference. When uh, we look at now the entire debate around a disability uh, benefit program that some of you may have seen, and that is because when, when you are 
one of those 1.4 million individuals with disabilities in this country that um, that uh, live with a disability and are social assistance, you are basically existing on about $1,300 a month on average. It's um, it's you know obviously incredibly challenging, and if you have a disability management program in place, you know the economic benefits. Um, you know, Rod talked to them at, at length, and we all understand that. But there are also huge benefits, you know, on the social side that we, on the personal side, uh, that um, that come from this. Um, we we heard, uh, you know, the, the comments, previous comments about uh, you know, both John and Rod talking about the extreme labor shortage, and it's something that certainly, you know is involved um, as part of a conversation here are those 130,000 people that are on social assistance in this province, are they a potential labor pool? And the reality of that is, uh, no, they're not. Simply because the outflow rate from the system, once somebody is on disability support, is on average between 0.65 to 0.85% per year. We had first looked at this in some detail in terms of uh, uh, some hard statistical evidence um, in 2008 when we had 70,000 people on disability support in this province. As part of the provincial grant, which mirrors the federal funding in terms of supporting workplaces, and, and you all have the, um, the, the PowerPoint, and we're certainly happy to follow up um, with you after that as well. Uh, the reality is that that just has not changed. You've been on disability support for a year and you have a 1% chance of um, ever going back to work again. So there are tremendous benefits um, across the board in terms of looking at what are the, uh, what are the um, opportunities and to support individuals up front. One of the things that is quite interesting um, in line with all of this and the evidence that this represents is that uh, starting starting uh, January 1st of this year, the Belgian government, which has a federal uh, disability support system with well over 400,000 individuals on disability support, started a process whereby they are assessing individuals who are applying for disability benefit at the same time on a parallel track to investigate whether or not there is an option for that individual to go back to their pre-disability employer, as well as to potentially support the employer. And what is of um, what was quite rewarding to us is that the Belgian government enshrined in legislation that these individuals who perform this service for the government must be CDMPs. So that has been the most uh, rewarding, the first jurisdiction in the world that has in fact legislated this. But uh, Belgium is not the only one. The Scottish government is embarking on an identical process. And so is the, um, and in fact, the Malaysian government, which also has a federal disability uh, support system, is uh, heading down exactly the same path. All within the context of driving innovation, thought leadership, the three C's of effective disability management, which is uh, creativity, collaboration, and commitment to support the individual upfront so that they don't head down the path of, I think as um, Craig identified, you know, in, in relationship to uh, in relationship to COVID, this is exactly the same applies, and all of a sudden you find yourself out of work. You find yourself dealing with uh, chronic pain and in absolute poverty, and then you have to frankly ask yourself, what's left? It's certainly questions that I have raised at the political level, and that's why I think whether or not it's at an individual level or whether it's at an institutional level, intervening early, support the individual uh, in terms of um, 
more effective return to work generates tremendous economic and social benefit at all at all levels and and of course i think as we all as we all know i mean um you know disability is or acquiring an impairment whether it's a mental or physical health impairment is an equal opportunity none of us know when or not we we get into potentially whether it's an accident or a bad diagnosis that from one minute to the next changes our life and our perspectives and supporting individuals uh, in um, in staying engaged in the workforce, maintaining equitable participation in society, being able to have the um, you know being able to have the um, financial resources to determine your future. It's it's conversations that some of us are having at a uh, at a political level and in terms of driving employment and that certainly is a key consideration but in terms of building and supporting a disability inclusion society disability management accepting responsibility and accommodating your own workers who acquire an impairment is the absolute number one step in terms of achieving this plus of course it um you know it's a key er element if you if you are truly committed to an in, you know to an equity diversity and inclusion strategy and if you're willing to move forward with you know ESG principles is to really take and move from taking a, a mission statement or an inclusion statement into actual outcomes that will make a substantive uh, difference. We we heard that, um, and uh, Sari mentions this that uh, you know we've not had a change in the fatality rate. We've had almost a thousand fatalities over the last ten years in in this province. Last year we had an eight year high rate of industrial fatalities. We had 166 workers in BC that acquired you know that suffered a a, a fatal. Uh, fatal injury or disability from occupationally related and over 5,000 people that suffer permanent disabilities. So we can make a difference. All of you can make a difference. And I certainly um, appreciate the opportunity of having been able to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. I think I've heard your story for the last 15 years and it Everybody needs to hear it. It's such a great story. And thank you for your perspective on it. Appreciate your time today. Very valuable. Uh, I want to introduce now uh, Lanny DeHeck. Uh, she is the manager, Occupational Health and Safety Disability Management for the BC Nurses Union, seconded to NINMAR to assist with the implementation of the Workforce Development Agreement that supports ill and injured workers in BC, and she's a registered nurse, CDMP, and a member of the CSPDM, I should know that off the top of my head, board of directors, and she is uh, somebody I can't work without. She does a lot of the heavy lifting, and so I want to welcome Lanny uh, at this time. Thank you, John. You can hear me okay? Excellent. Yes, um loud and clear. <laughs> Okay, first off, I have to say, Dr. Goss, when you were talking about showing up in pajamas, there was one time in COVID, you're right, I came running down the hall, I had a Zoom meeting in my pajamas, I threw my denim jacket on and called it a day, but uh, <laughs> I only did that once. Um, uh, so anyway, I appreciate this opportunity um, and I just want to build on this for my colleagues, uh, my CDMP colleagues, uh, with the CSPDM here about how to make this practical. What does this mean, um, this information? And I think somebody, you know, one of the speakers has already spoken about taking this information back to your workplaces, to your colleagues, sharing this information. We're trying, uh, what we're doing as part of the grants is to get this message out about the impact of, of effective disability management, the impact to employees and employers about disability uh, and it's, it's important that this message is heard at all these different levels so from senior management uh, you know and that's part of the message that Wolfgang has been deli delivering um, workers compensation boards 
in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario in particular are fully uh, behind this project and sharing the information with their employers. Uh, we've been speaking with human resource professionals, again, coming at it from that different angle. Uh, with workers, with unions, with other employers. Uh, and so I think that's the key message here is to take this information back to your your workplaces, uh, speaking with your your representatives in who you're working with, your colleagues in human resources in labor uh, with the if you're in a unionized workforce. If you're you're not, you've got worker probably representatives, talk with them as well. The key issue is about safety, as, as Terry has mentioned, and, and making health and safety. Uh, important and and a regular part of the day-to-day -day conversations. And if we're involving all of the parties, then we're we're all talking the same language, and we can understand, and we can collaborate together, and we can build and shift that culture. Is is the key message? Um, very briefly, I wanted to say, you know, this these grants. There is the in BC. So for those of you from British Columbia. Uh, as residents, there's the Workforce Development Agreement Grant uh, that is funding for you to take continuing education, uh, the bachelor program, if you wish, or work site agreements. And for the other provinces and federal uh, work sites, it's under the federal initiative. So a, a, an equal uh, program where you can all access this, this continuing education uh, and the workplace audits. So within healthcare in BC, we have the Enhanced Disability Management Program, or the EDMP for short. It was uh, born out of a workplace audit of a similar grant back in 2008 when BC wanted to showcase accessibility uh, prior to the Paralympic Games. And it's been in place now, we're going on 10 years. It's a collaborative program uh, where employers and unions work together to support ill and injured workers, to keep them at work or return to work sooner if, if safely able to do so. Uh, I'm not gonna, not a lot of details there, but I'm gonna provide some information on the website and happy to talk to individuals and provide the, the, the details. There's, it's all online in terms of the program itself. But we're also building on that. And, and as an example for, you know, under this grant, and again, people have talked about that collaboration that's important between employers and and the workers. Uh, we are utilizing some of the grant funds to do joint education. And Sarah, you mentioned that this in round joint. We have a workshop, um, two modules being delivered uh, starting in, in a week that we've invited practitioners who are part of the health authority part of healthcare in BC, so pardon me, that's including health authorities, unions, insurers, WCB, um, uh, independent practitioners who are providing some services to long-term care. We're inviting everyone to come together and participate in this union. We have 30 um, and it's gonna be diverse discussion and great learning and really get an idea about your roles and responsibilities and learning um, to respect that and understanding that. So that's a way that we're using this grant to do that. We're gonna be delivering it over two hours in a Zoom over a couple of different days. Um, we're delivering modules over one day in a in-person or on a Zoom session. So when I think about our group here that I'm speaking with, thinking about your colleagues, taking it back to, to your work sites, are there groups that we could come together and share a module with and share that information and learning uh, or as a group of colleagues yourselves. And afterwards, there'll be information on the, and there actually already is, but some more information on the website around the grants and the opportunities. And uh, folks like myself or others at NIDMAR are happy to talk to individuals or groups about how we can deliver this information and these modules and learning so that we can build this together. And I think those were, I think some of the key points that I wanted to, to just touch on there, John. So I'll leave it at that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. So we're moving to the 
Q&A portion of today's session. So I'm wondering what questions. We have a pretty active Q&A board up already with some comments. Um, I think the first question though is to uh, Wolfgang. And it, you spoke about disability inclusion. Um, I believe that employers play a significant role. We've heard from WSIB in different forms through NIDMER. Is there any traction from other WCB jurisdictions to participate and collaborate to further support a federal initiative in return to work NDM? Yeah, I think uh, that's a that's a great question, and I should uh, and, I, and I should say that uh, uh, the this particular federal uh, initiative that provides the educational support, scholarships, assessments, and so on, was formally supported uh, as well by the CEOs of the uh, Alberta WCB, Saskatchewan WCB, and of course the uh, uh, you know you uh, you guys at the um, at the WSIB. So, um, so that's gaining some you know great traction as well as the HR HRPA in Ontario, the Canadian. Indian Mining HR Association, several other human resource organizations. So definitely um, there is some key commitment from other, other WCBs uh, as well. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Gose, there's a question for you. Um, when your patients are recommended to remain off work for mental health reasons, what do you recommend to help maintain the employment relationship between the patient and their employer? And their employer? Hmm. It's hard to provide a generic answer for that. It really much depends on what the, the worker's illness and, and functional capacity is and what their, their job is. Um, depending on a bunch of factors, the ideal would be that uh, if they're well enough to to maintain some ongoing uh, commit uh, contact with work, or if there's upgrading to go on, non uh, non demand stuff to keep their foot in the door, as it were, uh, tr keep on top of training, uh, keep uh, appraised of the new developments in the company, just keep them involved in what's happening, as opposed to expecting any actual work from them. And again, it, it's a bit of a generic answer, but it would depend very much on the particulars of the. The, the the job and the individual what was going on but we'd like to try to keep if possible and if there's goodwill too goodwill between the employer and employee to keep them uh, in, in the in the picture and i think the principle is to maintain that relationship as much as possible but there are exactly. all kinds of different circumstances that uh, the employer and the worker will experience there's a lot of uh, talk um, chat about on the q a but working from home and both the opportunities that get presented with working from home, such as the flexibility, um, work-life balance. Um, and there's some questions about the risk of working from home and somebody's asking, I think Marva's asking, employees are at risk working from home. However, there is increased requests for accommodations to continue to work from home for mental health reasons. How do healthcare providers who provide such request factors to expected care for these employees? So I, I don't know, Dr. Gose. Um, as, as I said, working from home is a double-edged sword. It has a lot of benefits, but it has a downside. And you need to be aware of these pitfalls so that you can protect yourself against it. Uh, working from home, if you protect yourself with uh, having uh, other sources of socialization, uh, having fitness so you're not uh, sitting for 10 hours or eight hours a day. And uh, uh, so you need to be aware, as I tried to point out, some of the pitfalls and protect against them. And then working from home can be fine. But uh, if you just work from home and, and ignore all these potential pitfalls, chances are it will catch up with you. And, and what initially looked like such a great experience will, will, will not be. And the problem is, it's it's subtle. It creeps up on you, and people don't realize they're 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 only showering once a week. They're not uh, calling their friends anymore. It's kind of insidious. It's a bit insidious the process. So worker education, like everybody who's working from home, should have worker education about the pros and cons of it and what to do to protect yourself. And I think that would greatly help because it's a it's a good thing to work from home in, in generic, but you had to be protected and know what to watch out for. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Lainey, there's a question. Will we be receiving a certificate of participation after today's session? It's an easy one. Yes, <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, yes, it will flow from an email that uh, confirms your attendance today. Thank you. Okay, I think um, there's a majority question. There is another question. Uh, sorry, it was, I just picked it up. At my organization, we we're having a lot of difficulty getting EEs to turn off as anxiety is being cited as the main issue. Medical documentation is being submitted to support this. How does an ER manage this? Uh, I don't know if you want to take that, point. Dr. Goss, <laughs> uh, work from home stuff. Yeah, it, again, it, it, it's, there are many cogs in, in this transmission. There's, there's the human relations for the employer, there's the employee, there's unions, a whole bunch of people, and you need to work together. So if the person is not working because of anxiety, then that needs to be looked into from a clinical perspective. What, what are the grounds? What are the problems? Is there something, accommodation, modification, et cetera, that can mitigate that anxiety? Uh, is the employer willing to, to be helpful to accommodate this employee? There are a whole bunch of stuff. It's, it's not enough just to say, oh, Jack is anxious and he can't work anymore. It has to be looked at as, as a, a, a complex situation. And many times people are afraid to go back to work. So that's why we, we very much are proponents of ease back, a gradual return to work, test the waters. So a, a lot of anticipatory anxiety has helped that way. And again, a bit of a generic answer, but it depends again, very much on the specifics of the illness and the work environment, but that's the general focus you'd go with. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that is our session for today. I want to thank everybody for participant. I want to thank the panel uh, for your really insightful uh, perspectives of disability management. I believe the message is loud and clear and the benefits uh, to professionalization and disability management as we help our individuals get back to work. I do want to let you know that next Thursday, September the 22nd, there is another webinar on Indigenous learning, truth and reconciliation, which is uh, utmost important um, session. It'll be fantastic. Uh, I believe Lanny is going to be hosting that for us. So please join me at that time. So thank you for today and until um, next time. Bye-bye.